Welcome, everybody, to today's webinar on self-managed work teams and the greenhouse model. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. One is that everyone's line is on mute, so if you want to ask questions, please use the chat box, which is located in the lower left-hand corner. All right. My name is Scott Brown. I'm a director with the Greenhouse Project. I've been with the project for about two and a half years now. Um, and in my role, I primarily spend time working with organizations to educate them about the greenhouse model. I work with uh, boards and executive teams in terms of their strategic planning. Um, and so I spend a lot of my time working with providers and helping them to understand whether or not the greenhouse model is going to work for them in their uh, situation. I've been in long-term care now for about eight years. Um, I have sort of a varied background, but I've always been in, in leadership and uh, strategic positions. And so that's kind of the mindset I come to this with. Today I'm pleased to be joined by Chris Angevine from St. John's Penfield Greenhouse Homes. Uh, Chris, would you mind introducing yourself to the people? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Scott said, my name is Chris Angevine. Um, I'm the team development mentor. Um, for St. John's, and I'm also a guide for our two homes out in Penfield, New York. I've been with St. John's about 12 years, and my previous history is all about the dining industry. So I've, I, um, I love that field, and now I'm in long-term care, which is a, is a big switch, but maybe not as much as you'd think. Um, I'm really enjoying kind of my journey here. I do a lot of education in our main legacy building um, around self-managed work teams, empowerment, um, the Eden Alternative and being a guide for the two Penfield Greenhouse homes um, has been wonderful. We've been open for the past four years um, out there, so that has been a great learning experience for me. And I'm happy to be here today. Thank you, Chris. So today's webinar, what we're going to try to do is give you, I guess, two different perspectives on um, self-managed work teams. One is we want to make sure that uh, you get sort of a, a, an understanding of how self-managed work teams work within the greenhouse structure. So we'll just give you a very brief overview on the greenhouse model itself for those of you that aren't familiar. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the organizational structure in the greenhouse homes. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Chris to talk about some of these other topics like uh, support and accountability, the coordinator roles, um, the kinds of education, and um, the really one of the really important questions, which is balancing these questions of, of quality and cost. And then we'll take questions. Um, and as I mentioned, your questions can be placed in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner. Our hope is there, here that you will get um, some sense of uh, the process and structure and also what it means in the real world to be executing and creating self-managed work teams for organizations. But first, just to give you a brief recap on the greenhouse model itself, um, when we look around and we see what uh, nursing homes look like today, um, they are very institutional. And in fact, um, they're essentially designed like small hospitals. And, and what was the reason for that? Well, the primary reason was that in the 60s and 70s when most nursing homes were built, um, caring for elders was seen as a medical issue. And so at the time, the hospital was sort of the pinnacle of medical care, which made that then the, uh, the model that was uh, followed in nursing homes. And so uh, for many years, that's sort of been the prevailing thinking. Um, I want to step back and, and about 30 years ago and uh, talk to you briefly about Dr. Bill Thomas. Dr. Bill Thomas, who founded the Greenhouse Home, at that time was a medical director um, in a nursing home in upstate New York. And, it didn't take him long to realize that the, the primary issues of afflicting elders in nursing homes weren't medical. Um, the real issues were what he described as the three plagues of loneliness, helplessness, and, and boredom. He sat down about 15 years ago now and said, well, you know, if, if we were going to design a, a nursing home from the ground up, it would take care of all the needs of people, and not just their medical needs, but also their, their personal or wellness needs, what would that look like? And he came up with a small house model, the goal of which was to replace 
traditional institutional nursing homes to small homes. Some of the key elements of this are uh, people have a private room, their own private room and their own private bath. Um, there's a kitchen in every greenhouse home and meals are prepared in the greenhouse home. There is uh, a design which promotes intentional community, which means that there is a living room, dining room, and kitchen, um, all of which are places where people spend time together getting to know each other and talking. Um, the greenhouse model changes three things. The most obvious thing that people see is uh, the architecture. In the original conception, the greenhouse model was a series of small cottages. Um, obviously, that's highly differentiated from what you see in terms of um, institutional nursing homes. Over time, though, the model has continued to develop so that there's now a model that is um, for, developed, for instance, for more urban areas, which uh, basically is a situation where the greenhouse homes are stacked on top of one another. Um, so, for instance, there is now a project on the Upper West Side of New York City that's being built that will have 22 greenhouse homes. Um, so that model has changed. But the fundamentals of each individual home remain the same. Second key differentiator is the philosophy of care. Um, one of the things that's central to the greenhouse model is person-centered care. Um, we believe in ensuring that, that all care is delivered um, with as much input from the elder as is possible, and that they have as much autonomy as possible to make decisions. And last, and what we'll focus today, is the organizational structure. Um, the organizational structure is, is quite different. Um, we flatten the hierarchy and make a number of other changes that allow us to accomplish our goals of providing um, great person-centered care in an environment that um, makes life worth living. Net result of this, and we know this from research, is that um, the greenhouse model improves quality of life, not just for um, elders, but also for staff. So I'm hearing that I'm getting some cutting out. I'm going to change my mic a little bit, and if uh, someone could uh, let me know if, if this doesn't improve it, um, and I'll go from there. So as I mentioned, the, the model itself has been found to improve quality of life for both elders and staff. The greenhouse model can really be uh, broken down into three core values. The first core value is what we call real home. This, the goal isn't to create home-like. It's to create a real home where people feel comfortable. Um, what we hear from people all the time is, we don't want to go to a nursing home. We want to stay home. And so the goal here is to address that by creating a real home environment where they have privacy and dignity. The second element is meaningful life. So one way to explain this is this is the greenhouse way of saying person-centered care. Um, but it's actually much, much more. Um, if you think about the idea of meaningful life, it goes beyond care. It go, and what we like to say is that um, when people live in, in greenhouse homes, the goal is to create a life worth living. Dr. Thomas um, makes a great point. When we talk about the um, stages of life. We, we think of childhood, and we think of adulthood. And we th as we think of people growing older, we think of um, that as merely a diminished form of adulthood. <clears throat> and what Dr. Thomas said is we've got to rethink how we view these stages. And he coined a term called elderhood. And the idea um, and the motivation in creating this, this term is to recognize the fact that people at every stage of life, including elderhood, there's, they still have the opportunity to grow and learn and to contribute in a way that makes their lives meaningful. So um, that is what we say when we have, um, when we're creating meaningful life. Last, and what we're focused our time on today is empowered staff. And uh, there what we're talking about is creating an organization that is quite a bit different than what happens in a traditional institutional nursing home. So when we look at a traditional nursing home organization, I think you would agree that this is uh, very similar 
to what uh, you see in <coughs> most uh, nursing homes. Um, you know, this very sort of hierarchical structure. And, and Chris, if I ask you, for instance, um, who has all the power in this structure? Who would you say? Well, looking at this, I'm going to say the administrator. And who has less power? Uh, LPNs, definitely CNAs. They're all the way down there at the bottom. And is there, when you look at this, is there anybody who seems to be missing from the model? If we're talking about decision making and person centered care, I don't see the elders anywhere on there. Right. So this model is, is um, very hier hierarchical. Some would call it siloed. And, um, but is representative of what is occurring in most institutional nursing environments. In the greenhouse model, we do uh, change and depict um, the model quite a bit differently. One is replace the elder at the center of the organizational chart. <clears throat> also, structurally, um, the way leadership is handled in the greenhouse model is we take a co coaching approach as opposed to a directive approach. And last, we define, redefine the roles and responsibilities of the direct care worker, nurses, and the clinical support team. So one of the things as I move through this, <clears throat> you'll see is we use different terminology. And I often get people saying, well, why do you have to use different terminology? Wouldn't it just be easier for you to describe using the same terms? And the rationale for this is pretty simple. Um, words matter. Um, words have a lot of meaning. And they also include a lot of our um, subjective biases. So some of the goal in changing the terminology is to help people change the mindset and expectations about how these organization works. So this is how we um, depict the greenhouse organization. And what you'll see is um, that elder who is at the center of the organizational chart. Um, and around them, you'll see uh, these circles, which are depicted with an S. And each of those S's represent um, something called the Shabazz. And I'm going to talk what that means. Those are the direct care staff, um, all of whom have been licensed with CNA as a CNA. Um, and then you'll see the clinical support team. So what's happened here is we have redesigned the traditional roles to balance care um, with treatment to support high quality of life. Um, in this model, the clinical support team operates as coaching partners. The Shabazim, which is the plural for the word Shabazz, work in partnership with su the support of the guide, the director of nursing, and the medical director. And the guide facilitates collaboration between all the care and clinical partners. In most organizations, the guide is, a, is the administrator, but that's not the case in every organization. Um, the key thing here is to ensure that there is this collaboration and the guide is responsible for coaching and accountability um, for the Shabazim and direct care staff, whereas the nurtures are coached and held accountable by the DON. So let me answer your question about uh, the Baz, and first of all, the name. Um, the name is actually Persian, and it is from um, a story, and the Shabazz in the story um, reflects people, or excuse me, reflects the king's falcon, and in the story, the, the king's fal falcon would look, overlook uh, the kingdom and keep an eye out to make everybody was, was safe. Um, we've, seen other, we've seen organizations use different words. Um, uh, we have a couple of Jewish organizations that are using the term adir, A-D-I-R. And um, in Hebrew, this means noble or powerful. So you can see how the name itself has been changed dramatically from you know, what, we, what we think of when we think of a CNA. The Shabazz position is a versatile worker position. Oftentimes, people refer to it as a universal worker. worker. So in addition to direct care, they also do light housekeeping, laundry, they do cooking, and they're responsible for activity and life in the home. Um, it's their job to actually be responsible and operate each home. So as you can imagine, doing this job is more challenging and requires more training than you would see for traditional CNA roles. So in addition to the CNA, 
um, Shabazz receiving another 128 hours of additional training. Um, as I mentioned, they're doing cooking, so they have to learn about safe food handling, and they need to develop culinary skills. They learn about CPR and first aid. They've got to learn how to maintain and manage the home, so all the equipment in the home and so forth. And then there's additional 48 hours of greenhouse training, which includes training in dementia care, um, critical, cli excuse me, critical thinking for clinical excellence, um, communication, very important, teamwork sk skills, also very important. So there's a lot of additional training to give the Shabazz the skills they'll need to be able to perform the roles in the greenhouse model. The purpose of this slide I'm putting up in front of you is to represent something that we call um, job shifting. So what happens is in this versatile care worker model, um, you actually dramatically change the kind of people you have working in your organization and who does what roles. And so what you can see here in the green is, is this much greater representation of this CNA Shabazz role. Why is it? Because they're taking on uh, many of the roles typically handled by laundry, housekeeping, and dietary um, activities and so on. So there is a dramatic change. Part of the value of this is that um, obviously you're providing more direct care time than you would in a typical model. The other thing about this model is it actually increases the level of engagement with elders. In the greenhouse model, we actually see four times more engagement with elders than is uh, true in a traditional institutional model. So when we talk about empowered staff and self-managed teams, what are we talking about? Well, the first thing is that, that the Shabazim are empowered, responsible, and trusted to manage the greenhouse home. This is something that, you know, when I talk to people for the first time, um, they look at me like, really? How does that work? Um, and so part of what we want to do today is talk to you a little bit about what that all means. This group works collaborative, collaboratively with leaders and members of the clinical support team. Um, so they're looked on as valuable members of the team with valuable input to provide. Um, part of that is because of their closeness to the elders, they have a great deal of perspective on the elders' lives, the challenges they're facing, and any medical conditions they may be suffering from. Um, the other thing about the way these teams are, are run is that it creates flexibility. So essentially what it enables the Shabazim to do is to respond in real time to the needs of the elders in the homes. And then the relationship focus, the fact that these Shabazim spend more time with elders than in a traditional institutional nursing home means that they have an opportunity to build stronger relationships and to know the elders better. Um, which helps them in terms of delivering meaningful life. We also see value in terms of outcomes. Um, Shabazim often identify um, when someone is, is becoming sick sooner so they can be treated earlier and therefore have better outcomes with lower cost. So the greenhouse model is actually the only culture change model that has been subjected to academic research. And what we find with the model is that it improves both residents and family satisfaction. Um, the quality of resident life and family satisfaction goes up. As I mentioned, there's more direct care time, there is more engagement with elders, and outcomes are better. Um, staff, we also see improved staff satisfaction, less job-related stress, and then, and I think this is very important, the self-managed work team isn't simply a culture change phenomenon. It's actually a really important element of the financial and operating model for Greenhouse. In addition to the fact that the model itself is preferred by consumers and so we see higher occupancy and improved payer mix, we also see operating costs which are comparable or in some cases even lower to traditional institutional nursing homes. So. When we talk about these costs, as you know, labor costs represent the vast majority of costs in operating a nursing home. The self-managed work team model is an important part of that. Now what I'd like to do is, is 
turn this over to Chris so she can talk a little bit about um, how this all works um, in the real world. Thanks, Scott. So I titled this kind of the art of balance. And when I talk about balance, I, really it's that support versus accountability. And how does that all look with a self-managed work team? Because it's different. It is. Um, you know, I wanted to go back to something Scott was saying about the Shabazim. Um, you know, we have such little turnover at our greenhouses, and it's because the staff, when you talk about a self-managed work team and empowerment, these Shabazim, for the first time really ever, um, have a really important job with really important outcomes that they're responsible for. Um, I have different Shabazim who have grown to be uh, different leaders. One is now a Girl Scout leader in her community, and she said, I never would have done this without this job. So uh, the staff satisfaction is, 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 is something that I know has kind of blown me away. So when I talk about the art of balance, um, support versus accountability, I wanted to talk first about our nurses and our Shabazim and the relationship between the two of them. We are very integrated, our team is. So um, the nurses, it is not a power over, it's a power with. They really work together with the CNAs, Shabazim, um, and develop these, what we really talk about, these deep relationships with the elders. And by them having such good relationships with between themselves, the nurses and the, and the Shabazim, uh, they work very collaboratively to provide opportunities for meaningful life, to look to clinical outcomes. Um, we talk about when we build these small homes, uh, the last thing that should drop off the plate is um, our clinical excellence because that is traditionally what we're very good at. It's the other, all the other things are running a home that you have to apply to this model. So the nurses and the Shabazim and that collaborative relationship is, I, I believe, one of the um, fundamental supports of these greenhouse homes. Um, so I wanted to talk about when we're talking about accountability, you know, obviously the nurses have a different kind of licensure than CNAs. So their job is really to help educate um, and also be a coaching kind of leader to Shabazim as they do their job um, and to help them recognize changes in conditions and um, how important it is to bring different uh, issues that come up and to be able to talk about them collaboratively and share the information they have with their skill set and their skill level. Um, kind of the next bullet point, the clinical support team. So these are your dietitians, your social workers, your therapy, um, therapeutic recreation people. Uh, spiritual care would also be in there. And that's really the team that is going to support the Shabazim as they run the house. Um, each one of these people is hooked up with the Shabazim. They check in with them with the coordinator roles, which I'm going to talk about in my next slide. It is it is really has been interesting to see this journey of how they become a coaching partner with the CNAs um, and sometimes the nurses as well, obviously. Um, and how does the dietitian really support that Shabazim as they're doing menu planning with the elders, as they talk about diet consistencies? Um, the Shabazim are now the one doing all this. They are they are taking the pot roast and making it into um, the consistency that the elder needs for their dietary requirements. And what does that look like? So obviously um, supporting them. And then also on the flip side, supporting them and helping them grow means holding them accountable. Um, a lot of times with a self-managed work team, everybody's like, well, everybody just gets to do what they want. Um, that is not the case. Um, as a leader, I don't get to do what I want in my own job. Um, and obviously the Shabazim, that trick of um, being supportive of them, but also um, respectively um, holding them accountable and really exploring uh, solutions and um, of issues together is really important. The director of nursing, um, very important out of the greenhouse, obviously. I look at this person is really talking, um, being kind of an educator, really looking towards the regulations, um, being that interpreter of the regulations, and passing that education and information on to Shabazim and nurses. Um, and, of course, the clinical support team, too, which hold those as well. They are the kind of um, point person for uh, that, that really medical model, which we need as well. We need our clinical outcomes. We are a skilled level nursing home, so that's very important, and that director of nursing kind of takes that role. Uh, the administrator, I really look at them as our business communicator. We, the Shabazim who work 
work there have to know their budgets. We can't ask people to be fiscally and financially responsible if they're leaders of their own home if they don't know what that means and they don't know their budget. So I really, the administrator is kind of that um, business communicator. They may bring in the finance department to talk to Shabazim about their budgets, which we've done before. Um, and lastly, we have the guide. Um, I'm a guide, uh, so I have learned a lot about myself through this journey, and I think that art of coaching um, and knowing when to when to step in, when not to step in, uh, is definitely kind of an art form, um, but it's very exciting, and it, it really helps you grow, um, knowing when to push, knowing when to sit back, um, knowing when to support someone, knowing when to take a hard line. That's really what a guide does. Um, they're there for the team. I always say, you know, the team's in there, the Shabazim and nurses are running the house, and I'm kind of, um, I feel like sometimes I'm standing underneath supporting it, just being there for whatever they need. So that would be the guide. So I mentioned these coordinator roles. At the Penfield Greenhouse Homes, we have two homes, 10 elders living in each home, and we have five coordinator roles out there. Every single thing that happens in your greenhouse or a greenhouse uh, can be tasked back to these coordinator roles. They are taken by Shabazim, so by the CNA Shabazim that work there, and they're rotated um, a, on a three-month basis is what we do. And therefore, you have a really great cross-trained, uh, versatile workforce. So the care coordinator, obviously in charge of just what you would think, um, care, are we getting people up when they want? Um, are people care needs being met? Are we communicating with families? Are we talking to elders? Are we honoring their wishes? Uh, the food coordinator, again, kind of the same lines of what you'd think. Um, at the house meetings that we have with elders once a week, uh, the menu always comes up. It's a big hot topic, as you can imagine, food is. So the food coordinator is really making sure that we are honoring people's choices. Uh, they're making sure that we're documenting. We have to document food temperatures. Yes, nursing staff has to document food temperatures and make sure that the dishwasher is running properly and that the refrigerator is at the right temperature. <coughs> Excuse me. So the food coordinator looks into all that and is kind of responsible for it. Um, the scheduling coordinator, uh, they are a self-managed work team. They do their own scheduling uh, four years out. Um, I'm very proud to be a part of this movement because they really never call me anymore. They cover their own schedules. Um, when they aren't able to come in, uh, they call somebody else uh, to cover their shift. If they can't, they call the scheduling coordinator who is their peer, and they will help them find coverage. Um, if it's maybe an overtime issue, they call me or the administrator, depending on um, who's taking those calls, just to approve overtime. So it's a really great way to get that scheduling piece, which I know is always tricky, into the hands of the team. Housekeeping coordinator um, out at the Penfield Greenhouses, we do all our own housekeeping. We don't have any housekeeping support. Um, each house has a different system on the way they get it done. So this is really a key to a self-managed work team. I, don't, I tell them as their boss, technically, the house has to be clean. That's it. Then it is up to that self-managed work team to say, all right, how are we going to get this done? Um, and they've done some different things by trial and error. Um, it's been really, it's, it's wonderful to watch self-managed work teams. It's, it's interesting to see what they come up with. Um, and so the housekeeping, we've changed a lot on different ways we've done it. And as I said, they do it different in each house um, currently. Um, the team coordinator is all about communication. So we know communication is a hot spot in any organization. Um, we are no exception. Uh, the communication or the team coordinator just really makes sure that um, things are getting out in the open. Uh, you know, I really, we have different education pieces that I'll talk about in a minute that really works on conflict resolution. Are we mining for conflict? Are we not letting things get too far? Um, of course, gossip can happen as well, and those are time stealers. So the team coordinator just is really looking out for those, making sure we're communicating to families, um, making sure the house meeting minutes are being taken. Um, and with all these coordinator roles, you don't always have to be, if you're the food coordinator, you don't have to be the one cooking. You have to make sure we're, we are cooking. You don't have to be the one to do it. Also, our team coordinator is responsible for activities and meaningful life. So they're going to be maybe scheduling the bus for an outing. Um, making sure that we are documenting our activities. Again, we have behind-the-scenes 
documentation. We have to stick to regulations. We have to have a monthly calendar. Are all those things being done? And those are handled by the coordinator roles. So when we talk about accountability, me as a guide, I can easily come back to any one of these coordinators and say, hey, what's going on with the schedule this week? I noticed some gaps. How are you doing? Um, you know, what can, I, what can I help you with? You know, um, so it's a great way for accountability to um, really partner with support in these coordinator roles. I put these two at the bottom just because um, if you have a certain thing, we do all our grocery shopping where we are, so we actually have a separate shopping coordinator who's responsible for putting the list together. I've also seen other greenhouses, and they've had a separate meaningful life coordinator who is, who is solely focusing on activities because sometimes those can drop off the plate when we've had really busy days. Um, St. John's, uh, I have, like I said, we've been open four years now. I have seen so many examples of these core values of the greenhouse. When we talk about real home, um, we just the other day we did an employee of the month out there, and the elders were out in the living room with all the staff, and it was one of our staff, obviously, getting employee of the month for all of St. John's. And one of the ladies, Vicki, said, who are those three men in my home? And it was actually our CEO, our um, marketing guy, and our assistant administrator. So I had to go over and say, guys, you got to go introduce yourself to Vicki, which, of course, they did. Um, but when we talk about real home, they know who's in their home. If you think sometimes of a traditional institution, you have strangers all around you. Um, but there's a doorbell. You walk in. There's a living room. Um, it's really different. We don't do tours. Um, at our greenhouse, we do something called tea talks once a month, and we get together, we come together at the table, and we have something called convivium, um, which is really sitting down at the table, sharing stories about the greenhouse, the staff are there, the elders are there. It's a way to get together and share our home, but it's a time that the elders and the staff have agreed to open up their home, and we do that once a month for an hour. Um, and we do that for people who are interested. Um, obviously, if someone's going to move in, we would be open our home, but other than that, we invite somebody to a tea talk. Um, we also have a 90-pound Mastiff lab mix that one of the homes wanted to adopt. The 10 elders came to consensus, and we have a dog that lives there 24 hours a day who's got a really deep bark, um, and that really it just sets the tone for real home. Um, the meaningful life, the relationships that we have out there um, are wonderful between, between the staff and the elders, which you would imagine, but also the elders themselves. Uh, we have an elder out there. It was one of the elders' birthday, another elder, and she wrote her a poem that was all about Laverne. She had her son type it up. She had one of the Shabazz get a frame, and she presented it to her on her birthday. It was just, I mean, it was really beautiful. Um, and then empowered staff. The, uh, the, the staff that works out there, they run that home. And throughout the years, this has been the, the education, the tools, the resources we have given them Uh and it's been building blocks where they've really taken over because they know how to run their home in their own house. They're the CEO. They're the CFO. Um, and they run the home, so they know how to do it. You just have to bring those same principles to work and make sure you're setting um, up the right system for them. So really shifting power. How does this really work? Um, asking questions, not giving solutions. I have answers. Obviously, I do. I'm in the position I'm in for a reason, so I tend to think I have a lot of good ideas. Well, so do staff. And the whole idea of empowered work teams is, and self-managed work teams is they're, they're the closest to the elders. So they clearly have the best ideas about how to run the house because they're out there all the time, and the elders live there. So they always come up with the best ideas. So not giving solutions, just asking questions and helping them get to the answer um, that is usually always there. Setting clear parameters, uh, this is huge. Uh, something you don't want to do for self-managed work teams is to take decisions away from them. So you, when you, what I've really found is to be very careful that teams know which decisions are in their hands and which ones aren't. Uh, I was training a team, and they didn't like the word parameter, so I called it dance space. <laughs> so what is in their dance space and what is without their dance space? Um, and it just really helps them uh, with success. We don't want to set, or I don't want to set teams up um, for failure when they worked really hard to come up with a um, decision or a plan. Um, I believe that people are smart. Um, I think sometimes in a hierarchical um, chart, like we saw with Scott's slide we had a little bit ago, we're just used to making decisions for other people, 
um, when they're way down at the bottom of the chart. But what I've found is, wow, they, people come up with great ideas, um, and they also really want to do a good job. The failing forward, I talked a little bit about that. Uh, it's probably been one of the hardest things as a guide for me to learn is when to step in and when to let teams fail. Um, and a quick example of this is, you know, when probably about a year after we opened, our garage kind of got cluttered and really messy. And the director of nursing said, Chris, you have to make them clean up that garage. And I said, no, I'm not going to. And she said, you have to. It's a mess. And I said, you know what, I don't care that much about the garage. They need to care about the garage. And I always say the elders aren't in any harm. They don't go out there. It doesn't really hurt them if it's messy. Um, so I let the garage go, and one day at a team meeting, it went on the agenda, it went on the clipboard, and the team brought it up. We have to do something about our garage. It's a wreck. And that really felt like success to me, which would seem strange. Um, I always say when the elders are in harm, all bets are off. Uh, we will, you know, it, it, again, that's when clinical swoops down and kind of says, okay, we're going to try this self-managed work team because the elders are in harm's way. So it's really kind of figuring out when to step in and when not, and, of course, to celebrate successes. That's huge. <laughs> um, I've been through a lot of education, and the Greenhouse Project um, has, I've, I've been through a lot of their trainings, which have really helped me grow. I've seen many of the Shabazim and nurses go through their trainings, and I've seen their development, too. Uh, so I'm very grateful to the Greenhouse Project. Um, I am a Greenhouse educator, which is to be an educator for the five-day program they go through that we talked about. Coaching for Partnership is really for that clinical support team and helping uh, the clinical support team members really understand how to have a coaching approach with self-managed work teams. Again, it's really back to that support and accountability, and how do I, how do I um, state issues clearly to people, um, and really help them work towards a solution without solving it for them. Um, that core team training, like I talked about, is the five-day training from the greenhouse training. Um, we also have, as, as we had on our previous side, the culinary training. And then it's very important after all that, as we found for four years, to uh, have refreshers and re retreats. So. And I think I'm going to turn it back over to Scott here to finish up our last couple of slides. So thank you. And hopefully Scott's still there. Yes, I, I am here, but on mute, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to answer a question, so I was moving. Oh, I, was, I made some great points, though. Um, you know, as we walk through the presentation today, you've kind of gotten a sense of <clears throat> some of the things that the Greenhouse Project brings to to programs. Um, you know, one of the things about the model itself is, you know, it's really clearly defined. Um, you know, that was is actually what has enabled us to do research because it's not something in one place and something in another place. It, you know, all the greenhouse project homes um, have the characteristics we've talked about today. Um, a big part of what um, makes this transformation work is something that Chris talked about, which is the education and training, as well as tools and resources we continue to make available um, to people with open and operating greenhouse homes. Um, one of the things I want to point out is that um, in our model, we actually train educators for each project, um, and this is important. Our goal here is to make organizations as self-sustaining as possible. So people like Chris and others um, have the ability to provide um, additional training to new employees um, or to provide refreshers and so on there on site without incurring any additional cost. We talked about the fact that um, the greenhouse model is the only research um, evidence-based uh, culture change model. Um, and you know, our early research was really on assessing the impact on elders and families. You know, the question was, does the greenhouse model work? Are the outcomes better and so forth? Um, the other piece of this is, um, and what we're focused on now, is this whole question of sustaining the model. Um, any of you that have done any big initiatives, any big uh, culture change initiatives, you know that oftentimes when you get started, 
there's a lot of excitement. And the challenge is continuing to maintain that excitement over a sustained period of time. Um, and so we've got research that's supporting um, some new initiatives we're launching to help organizations continue to sustain the model. Um, the Greenhouse brand itself has a great reputation. It was called the pinnacle of culture change um, by Provider Magazine. And you see a lot of this reflected in the media coverage. And in the last two years, we've had uh, 300 um, media mentions, including articles in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Kiplinger's, The Atlantic, um, so many, many national outlets as well as regional and local outlets. Um, the other thing we've learned, too, is that um, this is a brand or a, that's con uh, that is preferred by consumers. Um, we did some research um, a couple of years ago, and we asked 1,100 uh, informal health care, uh, excuse me, informal caregivers. So that would be daughters and sons of, of um, aging people. You know, what would they prefer, the greenhouse model or traditional model? And um, the feedback we got was, not only do they prefer the greenhouse model, they'd be willing to drive further and um, pay more for the greenhouse model. So we know that it's preferred by consumers. We see um, an impact also in overall occupancy. The average occupancy in greenhouse homes ranges from 96 to 98 percent, even in states where the statewide occupancy is in the 70s, like in Arkansas, for instance. Greenhouse homes still maintain occupancy in the mid-90s. And then this whole issue of sustainability. Um, when you embark on this kind of a journey, you've got to really think about that. The Greenhouse Project has a peer network, which means a few different things. One is you have access to greenhouse adopters across the country. So if you have questions, if you're encountering challenges, there's probably an organization um, that has encountered the same thing and has um, tried to address it, you can actually learn from that, them. We also do monthly webinars. Um, every month we do education on a variety of topics. Um, there are also a variety of tools that are available um, for training. And every year we do an annual conference. Um, the annual conference brings together, uh, well, last year we brought together about 250 um, representatives from greenhouse homes across the country to talk about you know, how to innovations in the greenhouse model, um, what's working, and how to continue to sustain success in the near term and in the future. So when we when we talk about the self-managed work team and the greenhouse model, you know, at this point we've got a, a big sample. We've got 187 homes operating on 40 campuses in 28 states in the U.S. Um, and 150 more homes in development on 25 campuses, which will open another five states. So a lot of what we have to offer is based on the experience we've gotten working since the first greenhouse homes were developed in Tupelo, Mississippi, 2003, up to the present time. So the model itself has been tried and tested, and we continue to learn um, as more and more greenhouse homes open across the country. Before we get to questions, I, I like the idea of, um, I like this quote I saw from Bill Grohl. Um, his complexion isn't quite as reflected in this photo. Um, I actually was a screen grab off a video. But, you know, when we talk about these self-managed work teams, when we talk about the Shabazim role, there is no doubt that it is a more challenging role than being a CNA. Um, and that's why the additional training is so important, and that's why the kind of supervision and support they receive from guides is so important. But if you look at the quotes that he from uh, the video, he talks about you know, how he, he describes himself as a lonely, lowly CNA. Um, he talks about becoming a Shabazz and having a job where he has some say. And he says, he's never worked harder, but it's worth it. And when we talk about the challenge of trying to create engagement with um, workers up and down the the organizational chart, this is an opportunity to create real engagement with your, your CNA or versatile care workers um, in your organization. Now what I'd like to do is open this up to questions. 
Um, we have a number of questions we've received through the chat box, and um, I will um, about a couple of them. Um, a quick one, we have a question about whether we have greenhouse uh, educators in Canada. Um, Alice, we, we don't have greenhouse educators or greenhouse homes in Canada. We were originally funded um, through a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that required us to devote our, our energies to people in the U.S. We, we do see this um, changing in the future, um, but the way we, we see things going at this point is that um, that kind of education training is available to people and organizations that decide to adopt the greenhouse models. So in other words, they're actually developing greenhouse homes, and the education is part of the package of services we provide um, and the uh, uh, for people who are, who are developing uh, greenhouse. Chris, here's a question from you. Um, can you explain the difference between um, a Shabazz and the coordinators? Sure. Oh, there it is. Um, a coordinator is a Shabazz. So these coordinator roles, as I said, we have five of them, and they are held by a Shabazim for three months. So at three months of a time, I have five different Shabazim who are CNAs in the home, and one is the food coordinator, one is the scheduling, one is the housekeeping, um, one is the team coordinator, and then in three months they go, okay, time to pick a new role, um, and then I just watch out as their guide to make sure they're switching. So, for example, we had Karen, uh, somehow she managed not to be the scheduling coordinator for about four years. I don't know how she managed that. She was just the scheduling coordinator, so she had a, a new understanding of um, the self-managed work team scheduling deeper than she ever did before. So they are held by CNA Shabazim in the greenhouse. And then that each of those coordinators are supported by a clinical support team member. So if you can imagine the food coordinator, they are supported by the dietitian in our dining department. The care coordinator is supported by our nurse leader or director of nursing and the social worker. The um, activity or meaningful life coordinator is supported by our therapeutic recreation person and so on. We have a question from Judith um, about... Uh, whether there's any television or documentary programs available to use the education of the general public. Um, Judith, one of the things that you'll receive after this are links to some videos that we've produced um, that should help you uh, in terms of that. Uh, we have, I'll send out a couple different versions. Um, one is a four minute overview, another is an 18 minute overview. So obviously uh, I've actually incorporated the uh, four minute overview in presentations that I do. Um, the 18 minute, obviously, you need to sit down with you know, maybe some popcorn to watch. But um, both of them, I think, give people a feel for what the greenhouse model is like, what the experience is for elders, and educates them to some degree about uh, the, um, you know, about the model itself and, and how it works. Um, Chris, here's a question for you. Um, another question about coordinators. Um, if there are five coordinators in the greenhouse, how many Shabazim are employed at each home? It, well, it depends on your ratio of part-time to full-time, but I would say about five to six full-time and two to three part-time. So obviously we have part-time people take coordinator roles as well. We just watch out which ones. Um, if it's the uh, scheduling coordinator, or sometimes the care coordinator, for example. We want a full-time person looking after that, um, but part-time people can take coordinators as well. So I would say five to six full-time, two to three part-time, and that's for a 10-person um, home. And also, just to clarify, at, at any one time, you typically have two Shabazim days and evenings and one overnight. So um, just to clarify how that staffing works. Uh, let's see, I want to go back. Uh, so I have a question from Joe about um, attending the 128-hour training for the Shabazim, Shabazim as well as management training. Um, Joe, at this point, the Greenhouse uh, Project only provides training to organizations that have made a commitment to develop greenhouse homes. So it's, it's not available on an um, a la carte basis, let's say. Um, so it's part of that whole package. Um, our goal here is to 
ensure that every element of the greenhouse model, not just architectural, but as well as the philosophy and the empowered staff um, gets implemented effectively, and the training is a piece of that. And Scott, I'll just kind of tag on to that. Um, there's also also how, how about training for the management team. And that's where I went to training through the Greenhouse Project. That's where I went to coaching for partnership. I went to coaching for supervision, adult-centered learning, education. So that, that kind of coaching leadership I got through the Greenhouse Project as well as a leader, um, I went away to that training if you wanted to speak to that. Right. I mean, the, the education is a combination of uh, in-person, um, on-site, I should say on-site and classroom um, at a central location. Um, and depending on the kinds of education that we're doing, um, it'll be the different venues. But a lot of the uh, education, we want to give um, organizations themselves the ability to deliver it. So um, hopefully that helps. And, and Joe, as I said, if you are interested in talking about uh, the idea of developing greenhouse homes, um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about um, the education and the services and, and so on. So um, Rodney's asking a question, Chris, if, how do you fill vacancies when you don't offer tours? We don't have a problem with that. Uh, at our website, we do a virtual tour. Um, and people, I talk to people on the phone all the time. Uh, people, they'll send them right over to me, and then we do the whole philosophy talk, and um, they'll also call admissions, and I invite them to the tea talk. Obviously, if we have an open room, then we're more than happy to show someone the house, but um, besides that, we don't have a problem, and we do have a waiting list. Chris, there, w there was one question I saw earlier on where um, there were, the question was, how much turnover have you had of residents in the greenhouse homes? Yeah, that's a tough one to answer for us. We have the two homes, and when we first opened up, we moved people out of our legacy building because we had to move 20 beds. I think everybody would understand that, right? So we moved people out of our legacy building to the greenhouse homes, and what we ran into is people got better at the greenhouse homes, <laughs> um, which was interesting for us because people transferred from private pay to Medicaid. It affected a lot of different things. So we actually had people get better, so we didn't have turnover right away. Um, and then we kind of hit a point where, you know, we had some people leaving us. Uh, so it's really hard to say after four years. We do still have some people after four years that were the original people that moved in. Um, but obviously we've had some change, um, but I wouldn't be able to really give you numbers at this point. There's a related question. Do the people that are typically coming to the greenhouse homes in Penfield, are they referrals from your um, legacy nursing home, or are they from the, uh, the the community itself? Well, it's really both, um, and probably more in the community now. Um, again, when we first opened, a lot of people didn't know about it as much, and now people are hearing more about this this small model of care, and we get a lot of interest. Uh, so some people will move into our legacy building um, and say, I'm waiting for a room. They're on the waiting list, and they needed more care than they had at home. So they move into our legacy building um, waiting to get out to the greenhouse. And we have a question from James um, who's asking about the picture we're showing right now. Um, what's the location of this group? Um, and he's also asking about the grouping of homes, that uh, whether that increases efficiency. So um, James, that is actually a photo from Green Hill in West Orange, uh, New Jersey. And <coughs> When you see greenhouse homes, they are typically grouped, um, and a, a big reason for that is, is in fact, efficiency, primarily with regard to nursing resources. So in the greenhouse model, while the, the Shabazim are assigned to an individual home, um, the nurses actually spend time between two or three homes. So obviously you don't want you know, two homes across town from each other. Um, so yes, we typically recommend that organizations build and configurations of three or six to maximize efficiency. Now, having said that, um, the most frequent number of greenhouse homes so far has been two, but the three or six actually helps you to um, optimize your, your nursing uh, resources. Scott, and I would imagine your clinical support team too. Absolutely, yes.
Hey, Chris, here's a question for you. Um, how do you schedule for retreats, and who covers the home while people are away? Well, we have per diem staff, just um, as any other home would, uh, but we do it one home at a time, so I don't have them for both homes, um, and we do our best to get the coverage that we can for that day. And it's the day shift, so sometimes we'll do some playing around with schedules, and the, the Shabazim will see what they can do and what they can't do. Part-time will pick up extra. Yeah, we make it work. Here's another question for, for you um, from Amy. Um, from the examples you've given, it sounds like your elders are relatively cognitively intact. Do you have residents with dementia? And how can residents who can't express choice fit in with the greenhouse model? Oh, good. I wanted to answer that one. Um, yeah, well, as, our, uh, as my good friend who is our dementia specialist here and educator here at St. John says, about 84% of our population are living with some form of dementia now. Uh, which was different from years ago when she first started, as she tells me. So, yeah, we have the same thing out at the greenhouse. I, I, maybe it does sound like, you know, um, everybody knows each other and chats all day long. They do. They just do it in their own way, um, the deep knowing relationships. And I know I can say it, to see it is amazing. Uh, because they know people so well, their mannerisms, their facial expressions, um, where they sit in the house will give the staff clues. They know them so well. Um, it, it, it amazes me daily when I'm out there um, how well those elders and staff know each other. And, of course, they have deep relationships with the families, too. So the families are all in there. The families walk in. They don't want to talk to me. They don't even really – they breeze right by me. Oh, hi, Chris. They go straight to the Shabazim. Um, they want to hear from them because they know that they are the people partnering in the lives of their loved ones. Um, and that really, to me, makes the whole difference of um, really that person-centered care that we talked about earlier. Here's a question from earlier. Um, are your homes uh, unionized? Ours are not. I have uh, talked to different, I know what Scott has, probably different projects that are unionized. We have um, actually the project I mentioned on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, um, they actually have seven unions there. And, you know, there was a negotiation process with them, but it's been um, really encouraging the level of support the unions have provided for the model. And I think it's a question of education um, and helping um, unions to understand you know, that, that this is not just better for elders, it's also better for the workers. Um, and I was actually pleased. I was at a uh, hearing with the city of, of New York, and uh, in addition to the management team from uh, the New Jewish Home coming out, they actually had members from the unions who were speaking out in support of the project. So um, they are getting a lot of support um, there. So it's, it's certainly a, a situation that uh, has been encountered and um, can be worked through effectively. Well, we're at the top of the hour, and I wanted to share my contact information. Um, for those of you that are interested in, in learning more, um, you can, uh, well, a couple things. One is you can go to our website, which is www.thegreenhouseproject.org. You can feel free to reach out to either me or to Chris. Um, and then uh, when I send out um, information, I'll send you copies of these slides as well as a link to a recording. Um, and we'll provide some more materials for you there. But um, if you have more questions, if, you like inf if you'd like some more information, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, Chris, do you have any last words? I don't. Uh, thank you for having me today. I, I, I love these webinars. They make me think. They push me um, and help me grow. So thanks for the good questions. Thank you so much for your participation today, and I hope you all have a, have a great day today. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.